Hello, everyone. Let's kick start an afternoon about play. And um, so our presentation making space for play um, start, everything starts from this image, this uh, stunning image. And uh, now it's much more recognized uh, because uh, more people are asking questions about this playground after since 2017. So we first came across the image of this playground in Shek Lei. Shek Lei is, um, if you, you're not sure about that, uh, is located near uh, Chin Wan. So it's part of for the former uh, Chin Wan New Town. And uh, we first come across the image of Shek Lei playground in the archives of uh, Information Services Department of the Hong Kong government. And uh, the bold design and how this landscape was incorporated into the background, the, the playground, had immediately caught our attention. And um, I guess uh, more people also find images about this playground in uh, the Hong Kong yearbook, uh, 1969. Actually, two weeks ago, a friend uh, picked up this yearbook in a flea market during the Chinese New Year in Sam Shui Po and they were wondering about the playground as well. So according to the yearbook, it, it reads that uh, the playground, believed to be the first of its kind of uh, Southeast Asia, um, was created by American artist Paul Selinger and was made possible by a donation of uh, $1,500,000 Hong Kong, 1500000 dollar Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm confused by my own notes. I should just look at it. It's a hundred and hundred and fifty thousand Hong Kong dollar from the Royal Hong Kong Jockey Club. So you can see a jockey club has been doing things since sixties. And Mr. Sillinger says he wanted to provide something people could look at and uh, also use for recreation. He hopes that this unusual playground will be the first of many. So. Um, we, our research essentially is about whether this playground is the first or are there, uh, uh, is it going to be the first of many? And um, so um, upon uh, following the initial discovery from the yearbook, the immediately uh, the uh, quickest inf way to find more information through Google is to realize that uh, an article was written by uh, McLe Mc McCleary for the August 1972 issue of the Rotarian magazine. Uh, it introduces uh, Shackley Playground and other inno innovative examples in Europe and Japan in the 60s. And um, in, uh, in October 1972, uh, Paul Sillinger was writing uh, to the magazine responding to the article. Uh, he thanked McCleary for featuring his work and went on saying how American designers were uh, hindered by bureaucracy and how he was given full artistic freedom in Hong Kong to carry out his ideas. So um, these are all the background. Uh, and strangely, for such a groundbreaking playground, there had been very little discussions and uh, very little information on the internet. And um, we wrote something together to present the initial findings and ask people for more information. The article uh, was quite well received and we, we, we received a lot of responses. 20 people wrote back to us and shared their memories. Um, obviously, although the original Shackley playground is gone for at least 20 years now, it is uh, still deeply embedded in the memory of uh, many. It was only then that uh, we realized how little information uh, Hong Kong has regarding the historical development of children's playground. Playgrounds are not like uh, buildings or uh, other forms of architecture, they are not built to last for many decades. Uh, they are often replaced easily and there's little documentation of their design. So uh, the fact that Shackley Playground was so prominently featured in the Hong Kong yearbook and in the magazine, um, plus the extremely overwhelming response from uh, the former users, uh, suggests that it functioned beyond just being a play facility. So. Um, Actually, the stark contrast between the generic of the shell playgrounds today and the Shack Lake playground in 1969 plumbs our key research questions. Now, if you look at the uh, current version of Shack Lake playground, it looks uh, this way and um, it's similar to other Hong Kong playgrounds. So, usually, you see a collection of uh, imported modular and proprietary 
equipment installed on safety method uh, floors. And this playground may not be very different from uh, the ones in Taipei or in San Francisco. However, in our research, we noticed that since the creation of satellite playground in the 60s and uh, until the 1980s, uh, a number of local designers had broken with the tradition of pragmatism. Uh, a pragmatism and in playground planning in Hong Kong. Among them, uh, many work in the language of abstraction and were likely influenced by the concurrent trend in Western countries of conceiving playground as art. So our research questions, um, so we asked what created um, Shack Lake Playground and other abstract playscape. This is one of our arguments that uh, we uh, identify the Shack Lake Playground belonging to a, a specific type of playground developed in the 50s and 60s. We, we name it uh, the abstract playscape. Um, so are there any other examples? And what caused the artistic freedom that Paul Sillinger mentioned? And how we situate Shack Lake Playground uh, and similar playground within the global and local playground histories? And uh, how was this type of playground understood? And um, so what set uh, the abstract playscape, apart from other creative playgrounds today. So, um, it's just some uh, basic ideas. Uh, in play and playscapes, uh, Frost, acco uh, according to Joe Frost, uh, he used uh, a playground is a design landscape that sti stimulate play behavior. He used the word playscape to describe different types of playgrounds, uh, including traditional playgrounds, adventure playgrounds, and uh, creative and ad adapted playgrounds. However, in our study, we hope to establish and identify that specific, specific type of playground, namely abstract playscapes, which were mostly imagined and designed um, in the few post-war decades of the 20th, cent 20th century. These were usually created by artists uh, who were influenced uh, by 20th century modern art and believe in the power of abstraction and art uh, as a means to inspire creative play. These playgrounds were designed uh, as total environment, and uh, meaning that the play equipment, furniture, and playscape are created in a way to form a complete whole. So um, in terms of the research methods, uh, we go through a number of uh, archives, and uh, more importantly, um, uh, former users of the Shackley Playground were interviewed, and some of them are here today. Uh, 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 we have also interviewed the younger son of Paul Sillinger. Uh, we have also talked to Leo and Elaine, who are here with us today. Uh, they are uh, very good friends of uh, Sillinger family since the 1960s. And um, also, uh, a number of playgrounds were visited uh, in Hong Kong, Taipei, Singapore, San Francisco, Seattle, and New York. Um, it was during the field trip to San Francisco, uh, Helen interviewed um, the younger son of Paul Salinger. And um, so um, we, I will say a few more words about the uh, how abs abstract playscape um, were, was uh, evolved since the beginning of uh, playground uh, design. And uh, to answer the question why Sackley Playground and subsequent playscape were built and uh, to understand their significance, we first need to look at the basic idea about playground. So uh, this uh, urban planner and curator uh, from, from Swiss, uh, Switzerland, uh, a Swiss planner, uh, once described the playground as a byproduct of the industrialized city of 20th, 20th century. So playground come in many different forms, but all of them are attempts at tackling issues related to uh, urban living. So playgrounds are not just there because children need to exercise their bodies. They are highly relevant to how adults imagine children should learn or live in a city. And um, the earliest playgrounds emerged in the 19th century in the forms of outdoor gymnasia in Germany as a way to encourage physical exercise and counteract the harmful effects of city life. Um, Sand gardens or sand boxes were developed later on to encourage creative play. These two models gradually evolved into traditional playgrounds with standard equip equipments, um, or what playground scholars usually call uh, the 4S, uh, 4S playground, 
uh, because they include slide, seashore, swing, and sandbox uh, that we are very familiar with today. In the, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, there have been increasing studies on child education and child psychology. Play was considered a beneficial activity, so governments and organizations began to provide more playgrounds to keep children off the dangers of the streets and to ensure that they were supervised and using their time in the right way. In Hong Kong, the first playgrounds were built as an attempt to prevent uh, crimes and, and ensuring that children had safe place to let off excess energy. For all of you who are parents here, uh, you know in Hong Kong, we often talk about Fong Din. It's exactly the same idea. So following a fire in um, 1955 in Shakit May, uh, I guess a lot of you are very familiar with the his uh, housing history in Hong Kong would know that. Uh, the Hong Kong government started to launch an extensive resettlement and low-cost housing program. As you can see in these photos, uh, there, are already, uh, there were already um, many, uh, uh, there were already children's playground uh, included in the earliest housing program. And um, as so playground is seen as one of the basic necessities of modern living. Uh, up to this point, the playgrounds in Hong Kong were still very traditional and functional. They were basically pieces of concrete floors uh, where imported play facilities uh, like these were placed. So these are more um, like the playground we see today. And however, uh, since the um, 1960 onwards, we begin to see the incorporation of some more sculptural elements in the playgrounds of housing estates. So these are some of the findings uh, we got showing uh, playgrounds before the Shackley playground. So already some of the uh, more uh, abstract and sculptural elements uh, we can see in Hong Kong's housing estates. Uh, like the, uh, this rather elegant concrete slide and the uh, concrete maze. So um, one particularly interesting finding we got is uh, about this play sculpture called uh, Tunnel Bridge. So these concrete tunnel bridge uh, could be found in estates built by the Hong Kong Housing Authority and the Hong Kong Housing Society. They look, uh, they look very similar to uh, the tunnel maze designed by American artist uh, Sidney Golden. Uh, but who is Sidney Golden? Um, this connect us to um, the movement that we are interested in, how playground connects to modern art. So um, in 1953, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in uh, New York um, and the pa uh, Parents Magazine and a toy manufacturer called Creative Play Things uh, co-sponsor play sculpture competition. The tunnel maze designed by Gordon had won the third prize. Um, so we can see that um, these uh, tunnel maze then being, uh, being installed in Hong Kong as well, but we're not entirely sure whether this is uh, a copy or, or really an imported uh, play uh, sculpture. So, um, but the trend of using sculpture, especially abstract sculpture as play pieces can be traced back to as early as the 1930s when uh, artists like uh, Noguchi, Isamu Noguchi began to explore the creation of playground by sculpting a piece of landscape. Uh, in the 60s, he even collaborated with architect Louis Kahn on the design of, um, of uh, another uh, playground. This playground was not realized. And uh, in around uh, 50s to 70s, there were other artists and um, designers who had who have a similar belief that abstract play sculpture can better uh, boost creativity and uh, imagination in children than traditional play equipment. These sculptures were usually made using cast concrete and there was not a prescribed way to play. The active involvement of Museum of Modern Art and modern artists helped to elevate playground or play equipment design to the level of art and play sculptures become associated with taste. If if we look at Hong Kong, although the tunnel bridges were popular from the 60s to 80s, local designers had mostly worked from a fairly pragmatic approach, and playgrounds had always been designed by architects or en engineers, but not artists. Uh, so uh, the strange case, an interesting case about the Shackley playground is that 
uh, it was created by an American artist called Paul Sillinger. And he felt that the playgrounds in Hong Kong were too uninspiring at that time. He proposed to the Urban Services Department that he wanted to build a sculpture playground for the children of Hong Kong. So uh, Helen will continue to tell you the wonderful story about this playground. Thank you, Samson. So um, Paul Salinger studied art in UC Berkeley and San Francisco Art Institute in the late 50s to 1961. He came to Hong Kong in early to mid 1960s and taught sculpture in the Department of Extramural Studies of the, Hong Kong, uh, of the University of Hong Kong. So as an artist, he has achieved a certain level of success in Hong Kong. For instance, in 1966, he was commissioned by Caltex to create um, a large steel sculpture, which is that one at the top left corner, for the concourse of the newly opened Ocean Terminal. He had also exhibited alongside other prominent local artists like Han Chi Fun, Van Lau, and Wu Zis Wong, and had connections with the most active and highly regarded young designers like Tao Ho and Henry Steiner. And so these images can give you a sense, uh, give you an idea of his style. So his works are very bold and um, they're full of curves and can be quite masculine at the same time. The dragon was made of steel and the gallery pieces were in fiberglass and epoxy. So um, Salinger had cited abstract painters Clifford Steele, Mark Toby, and Stanley Hayter as his influence. He was also inspired by left-wing intellectuals, including Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn. So he's a very socially conscious person. He, um, he did not want to just work um, with the galleries. He really wanted to create art that common people can appreciate or even interact, in, interact with. So he noticed that as much as 40% of the Hong Kong population was under 18 years old at that time. So the society was changing rapidly and many of these children suddenly had to move from villages to modern skyscrapers. So um, Shackley Playground was his attempt to answer to the needs of the time. And he wanted to make a playground that can help these children to develop individualities and creativity. Apart from exercising their bodies so that they can adapt to the challenges of living in a modern city. In a media interview, he had mentioned the new idea of using sculptures in playgrounds in Europe and in the United States. And he was also aware of the adventure playground movement in Europe. While the earlier playgrounds in Hong Kong were built as welfare facilities, which allowed children to have physical play on swings and slides, Paul Salinger wanted to go one step further to create a sculptural environment to encourage creative play. He was probably appreciative of adventure playgrounds in Europe, uh, which allowed children to build their own play environment using scrap materials like wood and metal and bricks under the supervision of a play leader. But um, in Hong Kong, he had to deal with various constraints. Uh, he had to consider how he could possibly retain that risk-taking spirit of adventure playgrounds, infuse that into his idea of sculpture park. But at the same time, because of limited resources, no um, play leaders could be provided to Hong Kong's playground. So how could children play safely without any adult supervision? But at the same time, he could keep that adventurous spirit. So in around 1967, he had suspe successfully persuaded the Urban Services Department to provide a 34,000 square feet site adjacent to Shack Lay Estate. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the construction cost was covered by a donation from the Royal Hong Kong, Ch Hong Kong Jockey Club. Shack Lay was a very large resettlement estate with 80,000 residents, and half of them were children. To give you an idea of the scale, this is the site of Shackley Playground, and that's the current Shackley Estate at the back. So the housing blocks of the estate went all the way from here, that's the basketball court, to 
there at the back. This photograph showed um, the old estate and the original um, playground designed by Paul Salinger. So um, that's the primary school behind the playground and um, the people who studied there told us that um, it's almost like their home turf. They always spend their time in the playground before and after school. So um, the redevelopment of the estate was started in around year 2000, and the original Shackley playground was probably demolished a few years before that. And this is a model of the playground made by Salinger. The site, as you can see, was bounded by um, large retaining walls on two sides and um, a long staircase to its west, that's the staircase, and as well as the main road. That's the Castle Peak Road. And for this site, he designed a series of play sculptures, one roller skating rink and a large mural on the retaining wall. This model has been exhibited in City Hall, and there seems to be quite a lot of excitement around the construction of this new playground. The fact that it was exhibited in City Hall also reminds us of how um, museums in America, like the MoMA, helped to promote the idea of playground as art. So for the actual playground, um, Salinger worked with concrete and bricks instead of steel or fiberglass. Because of the larger scale, he also had to rely on construction workers to realize his design. Perhaps for the, this technical reason, the forms of the sculptures were less complicated than his gallery pieces. Now, as you can see, Salinger had actually given names to some of the sculptures, but these names were only known to himself. He actually um, had not put uh, a nameplate on the sculptures. Um, so um, that's why actually many uh, former users of the playground would make up names by themselves. Um, so all these names actually show um, how Salinger really treated the playgrounds as a piece of artwork. It's very cute, Sam's handkerchief. I don't know who Sam is. <laughs> and who's Julian? <laughs> the playground was opened on um, the 4th of September, 1969. There had been a lot of celebration. The opening ceremony was attended by the prominent banker and politician Kenneth Fong, who was also a board director of the Royal Hong Kong, jo Hong Kong Jockey Club. There was a line dance, a roller skating performance. At the, that roller skating uh, troupe, the team, was actually, uh, they actually came from Morse Park. Um, and possibly a modern dance performance choreographed around the play sculptures as well. This is probably taken during a rehearsal. Otherwise, if it's a real performance, there should be many spectators around the sculptures. So from the opening to its demolition in around the late 90s, the playground had been enjoyed by generations of Shackley residents. The locals like to call it the sand pit or three level park. Families used it as a photo backdrop because their homes were too small. Teachers from the nearby primary school let the st uh, students roam free in the playground during PE lesson. Some of our interviewees told us that when they outgrew the playground, they would still introduce it to their outside friends as if it was a very remarkable tourist destination. And one of the interviewees, Lao Wang Tat, uh, Mr. Lao is also with us today, had even created drawings and ceramic sculptures inspired by his memories of Shackley Playground. These are all evidences of how a well-designed playground can function beyond a place for, uh, for children to play. In the case of Shackley, the playground also served as a community icon and a gathering space for residents of different generations. It invited creative interpretations as evidenced by the work of Mr. Lau, and its impact can last for a long time. 
So shortly after the opening of Shack Lake Playground, Salinger returned to the United States. The government had not built other similar sculpture playgrounds as he wished, but there were architectural designers who continued to um, create abstract playscapes in different ways. We're going to quote two cases and compare, compare them with Shack Lake Playground. So for instance, Palmer and Turner was responsible for the design of Ping Shack Estate and its play areas. The project was completed in the early 1970s. So um, at a southeastern corner of the site, PNT had created a series of abstract sculptures in concrete and metal. The designer had made use of the slopes to embed a number of terrazzo slides and carved into the ground to create a sandpit. So uh, that's the sandpit at the top. And there are slides scattered around the site. So, um, so everything has been demolished except for the hut and the bench and the blue slopes. So, um, so if you go there, you can still see these historical <laughs> remnants. So these are some of the... Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I guess it'll be fine, yeah. <laughs> and one of the most intriguing elements of the playscape is a structure called the ruin. So what is a ruin? Why do you have a ruin in a children's playground? <laughs> it was a set of intersecting concrete planes and frames. Our guess is that it is a modern interpretation of the picturesque ruin in traditional landscape gardens. So in 1975, the Peninsula JCs, which um, a charity group, organized a new playgrounds concepts competition. The winners were a team of architecture students from the University of Hong Kong and the friend who was a young designer who graduated from the Hong Kong Polytechnic. The design concept was to create a series of connected sculptures to encourage group activities, cooperation, and imagination. The designers had also uh, considered incorporating elements like metal pieces which children can strike and make sounds. These were all new ideas in the field of playground design in Hong Kong at that time. So that's the actual playground. After the comp competition, the playground concept had been accepted by the Urban Council and the Architectural Services Department had incorporated the design in Shangsheng Street Park in Homantin. The park is still there, but everything has gone. <laughs> Again, the play structures were mostly made of intersecting concrete planes, which were connected by metal frames and chains. If we look at uh, the playscape designed by Paul Friedberg, for a housing estate in New York during the mid 60s, we would notice that the two designs actually shared a very similar language. Paul Friedberg is a landscape architect who advocated the concept of linked play. For Jacob Rees Plaza, he tried to blend adult spaces like an amphitheater and landscape gardens together with facilities for children like the playgrounds. By connecting different uses, he created an ever-changing landscape that was stimulating to the senses and attractive as a multifunctional community space. So there is a good reason to believe that the designers of Shangsheng Street Park had used the idea of linked play as a reference. If we compare Shack Lei Playground, Peng Shack Estate, and Shangsheng Street Park, we would notice that although they had all employed an abstract language and used that as a way to inspire free play or free interpretation. They're different for how they were initiated, but for Shackley Playground, it was initiated by an artist, but the other two were commissioned. So, and the latter two examples were more architectural and not really meant to be appreciated as a piece of art. So what were the conditions uh, which 
created the kind of artistic freedom that Paul Selinger described and which allowed similar abstract playscapes to appear in Hong Kong between the 60s to, nine, uh, to 80s. The profession of landscape architecture was not formally introduced to Hong Kong until the 1970s, when the Hong Kong government launched the 10-year housing program and started to build new towns. Around the time when these playgrounds were built, the profession was not that mature as compared to today. The Hong Kong planning standards and guidelines were still in the process of formation. Adding to these factors, most resellers of proprietary playground products uh, were founded in the 80s, meaning that playground designers had to rely on their own creativity or imagination before these com commercial products become, uh, became more common or easier to import. So we believe that these constraints, including the lack of regulations, had created a kind of accidental freedom for playground designers. Um, before we conclude the presentation, um, there is actually um, almost a world premiere of a, a, a documentary, a film. And uh, we hope to take this chance also to thank uh, M Plus and Design Trust because uh, without the support of this research, I think the film will definitely be buried in um, St. John's son's uh, own home. Uh, in, and we, no one would, in Hong Kong would be able to see it. So through this research, one of the biggest findings is to uh, rediscover this documentary. St. John returned to the US and he come back for a few times to film, uh, uh, to, to f complete this film. And uh, he was struggled to, and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so <laughs> he struggled to complete the film and it was finally made um, uh, and being screened on the television. But uh, it was not subsequently seen uh, ever uh, since, that, since that time. So uh, you'll be able to see the construction process of a uh, Shackley playground through the film and get an idea of uh, children's life in the public housing estate of the 60s. So uh, it was only screened once in the, uh, in the US. And this is the first time um, it's being seen after almost uh, four dec uh, more than four decades.
Um, Salinger actually made this documentary to um, trying to pitch to the um, um, the parks de uh, department of American cities. He was trying to he hoped to build more playgrounds like this in the U.S. But um, he got a few very small commissions, so the scale cannot be compared to Shackley at all. So, um, so abstract playscapes are not just about um, the certain image or style. They reflect an era in which artists and designers believed that their own vision could be translated into complete um, land, uh, playscapes. Um, such endeavors were enabled by institutional uh, freedom surrounding playground planning and design before there were, uh, these were incorporated into more professional uh, working procedures and workflows, which determine how playgrounds should be made. Through the latter process, playgrounds are made through the collaboration of different parties, and greater weight is given to various utilitarian concerns, such as cost effectiveness, durability, maintenance, or, or safety, rather than artistic merit or inventiveness. Under this setup, playgrounds are often considered uh, facilities to fulfill certain practical functions rather than a playful landscape which maintain a level of flexibility and open-endedness. In the case of Shackley Playground, we can see that the um, abstract landscape, because of its uniqueness and distinctive image, could also become a site of sociality, community memory, and inspirations. It is also significant that um, the playground was not initiated by municipal authorities. It was a bottom-up project initiated by an individual who tried to respond to the absence of stimulating play spaces. So um, I'll pass to Samson to wrap up our presentation. So as such, uh, we believe that abstract playscapes uh, are not just about their distinctive look. Um, they are also products of a different social condition for design and a particular conception of what spaces of play should be about. And um, if we, we were to ask what one can learn from uh, abstract playscape uh, in contemporary cities, in the contemporary settings, and we have a lot of current debates about design, we would not make the simple conclusion that um, play uh, playground of this style should be built again. So uh, this is not the point we want to make. Uh, instead, uh, we think that uh, design, uh, design cultures and professional procedures of playground planning have substantially evolved since the last century, and uh, more concerns and calculations needed to be taken into account in contemporary design. So uh, as play scholar uh, Joe Fro said, uh, the best playgrounds are never finished. Play spaces need to be constantly evolving to meet the changing needs. But uh, through the study of abstract playscape, particularly the um, Shackley playground, we were reminded of the very rich potential of uh, playgrounds other than the uh, utilitarian ones and how we might uh, possibly revive the creative and risk-taking ethos in the planning of future playscapes. And uh, we are particularly happy that uh, we are able to show this film uh, 50, exactly 50 years after Shackley Playground opens to the public and uh, remains to be a particularly important piece of art in Hong Kong history. Thank you very much.